Yes, no, very much. You know, I think um, it's very far from me. <laughs> and having traveled a lot, you know, um, sometimes it's, it's too much traveling. But I thought since I haven't been in Spain for a long time, I would love to have that contact with the audience here again. Sometimes uh, we live in a society where everything is so much concentrated on the individual and especially uh, the human is like the center of the world. We don't want to know anything um, even though in the question of climate change and everything has sen uh, sensitized us you know, to other dimensions of our life. But um, since we are so focused on the human, uh, in cinema in particular and in documentary, if people don't see immediately story of some individual, they would immediately ask, uh, uh, we can't relate to the film because we don't ha have the story of people. Yes, but the story of people for me is uh, so small in relation to what I was dealing with in that film, uh, Forgetting Vietnam, which is the element of water. And this is because in Vietnamese, the name for the country, nước, is water. So when you refer to a country, you refer to water. And you can also, also see by the way uh, Vietnam is situated on the, on the map that it is mainly water. And the country is crisscrossed by thousands and thousands of um, rivers, you know, and other forms of uh, water. And so it was important for me also to bring in the element of the sea, the water, but in relation to the sea, you have something that is done by the human, which is the boat. And in your case, you know, I think it's very nice that you relate it to the island because these islands, you know, are considered as um, uh, as the body of a dragon. So it is the dragon uh, in that part uh, of the film that you see. It's called Ha Long, which means the descending dragon. But also, it's the rising Hanoi is the rising dragon dragon that comes out from the water. So I usually ask people, because these are places that are very touristic, I ask them, what do you see? Do you see the rising dragon or do you see the descending dragon? And in that sense, you know, the island and the water, the dragon always go with rain and water. So uh, it's also the symbol for power in many Asian contexts. And it is on this uh, symbol, this myth, and the legends, the old legends that I work with when I went back to these places. You know, rather than seeing ourselves as individual, uh, this is also very, very much um, characteristic of Western culture. You know, the story of the individual, the focus on the success of an individual, and so on. Uh, rather than focus on that, I think it is much more um, helpful to focus on what I would call the forces. So, for example, uh, in a film, it's not a question of focusing on individuals. That's why when you look at my films, I usually work on the everyday, because the everyday is at the same time very familiar and very unexpected. It is something that you cannot control. So in, in presenting the everyday, I'm not focusing on individuals per se, but I'm focusing on the forces that come into the film and that motivate the direction of the film in certain ways. So when I'm shooting, when I'm writing, when I'm editing, all that is a question of form and forces. And f when I use the word form, I use also in a very, in the widest sense of the term, a film that you put together is a form, but so is the filmmaker. The filmmaker is also a form, and all of us, you know, are vibrant forms. <laughs>
And in society, we can say that it is because we don't recognize all the forms that we have all these conflicts coming up so that people think certain forms are more worthy of attention than other forms, for example. And we have the question of sexism, racism, and um, other kind of discrimination in our society. But if you look at it in terms of form and forces, it uh, widen the field of how one live our reality and also how one create. Certainly, you know, I would be speaking on, on that aspect, uh, especially in relation to the last book that I wrote, which is called Love Seidel, Walking with the Disappeared. So it's not just walking as this is one of the main activity of women's struggle. You know, they walk all around the world. I also made um, a, a huge installation for the Musée du Quai Banli in Paris when it was inaugurated. I made this um, installation on walking so as to invite people to walk and notice, um, to walk, in other words, toward the world in a, with a very different attitude than when you walk in order to, quote, discover the world, right? This is the colonial term. Uh, colonial mind always think of walking as a way of conquering the world or of discovering the world. But the world is there, you know, we are just walking in order for the world to come toward us. So this is what one of the first um, departure, you know, from the kind of walking that one could imagine. So when you want to let the world come to you, you have to walk very differently. Uh, the walk is different for the one who receive than from the one who always project and conquer. Um, this is one of the activity of everyday life. There are other struggles all around the world where the everyday is extremely important as a way of resisting. Here, for example, we can think of the Tibetan struggle where at the same time as you have a form of resistance that is earth-shattering, you know, really, because people are self-immolating themselves. They are immolating themselves in resistance. And this is um, an act, you know, that really shake the world. But on the other hand, you also have people who resist in a way that is less uh, dramatic, and it is in their every day, every Wednesday, for example, all around the world, you know, in different cities, Tibetans are buying, thinking, eating, speaking Tibetan. And this is a way of reaffirming, of keeping their identity as non-Chinese. And so the more, you know, a regime is oppressive, the more people have to um, come up with creative tool of resistance, creative way of resisting. And it doesn't always have to be collective. It can be something that is carried out with a collective spirit, but in a way that is very individual. So each one in whatever places we are would be carrying out also the struggle. You know, I don't think in terms of uh, past, present, and future, because very often people tend to think of time in a linear way. So you think of progress in a very linear way. And we tend to think also that as we advance in time, uh, what happened in the past is obsolete, less relevant. But for me, uh, digital technology is very close to the Middle Age in many ways, you know, and um, when we talk about a struggle, there is not one moment that is more relevant. Each moment is very relevant when we are fully into it. And so I would not say that today we are much better off as feminists, even though, of course, if you go into the details, you can always 
come up with the fact that uh, there are more women in education, for example, uh, there are more women in the workforce. We can always come up with these details, but with women in the workforce and in education, the problem simply changes. It doesn't mean that women have now you know, uh, no longer need to struggle because all around the world, if women are marching, it's because the problem is still there. It just changed phase. However, I would say that one of the aspects that is very striking because there are also a number you know, of uh, thinkers, even progressive thinkers, who think that today feminism is over. It's like a phenomenon of the 70s, the 80s, but that now we are living in a time where the question of feminism is considered as something that we have overcome. And I would say that the march, uh, and especially the Pink March, you know, in Washington DC, right after the day of the, our current president's inauguration, that march that has grown so wide all over the world, some five million people, you know, walking, it's a march that, um, even though it's focused on women, it has many alliances. This is the aspect that I think has changed with new technology. It allows us not only to carry out the struggle, but to carry it out with the alliances of all kinds of struggle. And this aspect, I think, is very important today. This is what become so different that we don't even recognize the kind of feminism that happened before, that happened in small location with uh, all kind of effort to raise consciousness, with all kind of collective work, small collective work, for example. These still exist today, but I think the, the part that really become so striking is that it has taken a global aspect.